Hello, everyone. Ladislas Maurice from The Wandering Investor. I'm here with a good friend of mine, Scott Osheroff. I always have a hard time pronouncing her last name. We met uh, last year in Uzbekistan, and he's the chief investment officer of the AFC Uzbekistan Fund. How are you, Scott? I'm well, Ladislas. Thank you for having me. We, we met under interesting circumstances. I was spending a month in Uzbekistan just looking at uh, investment opportunities on the ground. I checked out real estate. I checked out the, the stock market. I looked at how one can obtain various uh, visas. I looked at how one can create a company. I was just spending a month talking to lawyers, talking to people doing business on the ground to see what the opportunities were. And I went to a secondary public offering an SPO of a state company, a glass making state company, and that was doing a roadshow around Uzbekistan, going around and presenting the company to potential investors. I went there out of interest and I met Scott there. We were, the two of us were two of three foreigners at uh, the event and that's how the, that's how the friendship started. So Uzbekistan when I talk to people about Uzbekistan, typically people don't necessarily know much about it. They think Afghanistan, they think it's part of the stands. Uh, only bad things come out of the stands, but no, I completely disagree. Um, I think it's a very interesting investment, investment destination. So Scott, can you, you're the expert. You've been there on lockdown for what, <laughs> six months? Since January. Since January, so you've been there for quite a while. Um, can you, you're the expert, can you elaborate on why Uzbekistan? Sure, would love to. Let me just pull up a little presentation. So Uzbekistan is at the crossroads of Central Asia, and it's a fascinating part of the world with a whole lot of history. Um, and U Uzbekistan really, um, Let's, uh, there we go. U Uzbekistan uh, from the Soviet Union times was really a largely a closed off country. Uh, it, it was ruled by by President Islam Karimov um, uh, until uh, since eighty nine until two thousand sixteen, and he focused very much on import substitution, which is ironically what a lot of Western countries are doing now as they try to regionalize the supply chains. So this country benefiting from Soviet uh, repositioning around World War II with moving factories here, this was actually the most industrialized um, Soviet satellite. And Islam Karimov continued this practice with a focus on import substitution, which created significant amount of inflation and um, really wasn't that nice to, to the average Uzbek. Uh, you had a persistent currency depreciation where anyone who could get dollars got dollars. It was a fixed exchange rate, so there was a raging black market. The currency was an absolute mess. It was sort of regarded as a second North Korea. There was forced labor in the cotton market, uh, which, or a cotton picking industry of which Uzbekistan's the sixth largest producer of cotton. Um, but, but amid all of this, with the import substitution is he created a very large industrial base. And it's actually the largest industrial base in all of Central Asia. So you have glass factories here, steel, cement, textile companies, um, bakeries. You have a, um, a confectionery company that makes biscuits, um, chips, all different types of candies and whatnot. That's actually now pursuing um, endeavors in the US to trying to export to the United States of all places. Wow, and interesting. it's the breadbasket of the entire region. So it's with the exception of say wheat and you know, the grains um, from a horticultural perspective, it's largely self-sufficient. It's a net exporter as well of high value commodities, whether it's grapes, cherries, pomegranates, et cetera, et cetera, apples. Um, so the, the economy was an absolute mess. It was closed off really until Karamov passed away in 2016 and his successor, Shavkat Mirziyoyev, who was the prime minister under um, Karamov took over. And pretty much overnight, he said, we're changing the country, we're opening up, we're going to liberalize Uzbekistan. And no one really believed it. He created a 
five pillar um, program to really rebuild the economy all the way from the judiciary to uh, improving the lives of the average Uzbek. And the reforms, there seemed to be a new decree from the president every week or multiple decrees. It was just, it was moving so fast. And I first came here in May of 2018. Um, by then they had already adjusted the currency to about 8,100 um, from 4,200 because the black market at the time was pretty much 100% greater than um, the official rate in US dollars. So they adjusted it and then they introduced e-visas but there were still capital controls. There was still an exit visa requirement for Uzbeks. Like That's in Australia. Li- like in exactly. Australia these days. <laughs> exactly. So Uzbekistan's liberalizing and other countries are becoming more Sovietized, if you will, um, to a certain degree. So Uzbekistan since has eliminated all capital controls for locals and foreigners. Foreigners can buy shares of banks. They floated the Uzbek Sum. So now it's driven by market forces. They've permitted a few dozen countries, uh, citizens to come visa free for 30 days. They have an e-visa system for 101 countries. They're, they're really doing it right um, with the intention of creating FDI and also enhancing the tourism industry, uh, which right now the tourism industry, I, I think it's up five or six times since the country opened, but it's still a measly 3% of GDP. And the, the potential, I, I agree, and the potential is massive. I, when I was there, I, I didn't just do business to, to be transparent with everyone. I also went around the country, did some, uh, all the touristy things, and the country is absolutely gorgeous, um, extremely rich in history, and it's definitely increasingly on the map for, uh, for world travelers. Um, so the, the potential for tourism is, is definitely there. And the, the whole visa regime, because yeah, to your point before, it was really strict. Um, I remember when I lived in Kyrgyzstan 10, 15 years ago, I tried to go to Uzbekistan, but trying to get a visa, the embassy was complicated. They wanted all this paperwork. You needed to hire some tour guide, et cetera, some government guy. And now you can just, most Westerners can just show up at the airport and you get a stamp and you're in easy. So fantastic. And during the winter time, let's say there's now there was already a Soviet built ski resort outside of Tashkent, but they just opened up last earlier this year, um, a new about 100 million euro ski resort with wow. high speed chairs, gondolas, um, a few hotels in the area. So you can arguably be skiing in Uzbekistan in the morning and by nightfall, you could be in Samarkand or Bukhara reliving you know, the, uh, the path of the ancient Silk Road. So nice. um, it's, it's a fascinating country with phenomenal infrastructure. I mean, I've lived in Asia for eight and a half years. I've lived in Mongolia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Uzbekistan, bar none, relative to when I lived in, in Vietnam. Um, Uzbekistan has the best infrastructure. I, I still can't, from my time there, I still cannot reconcile the gap between the GDP per capita and the infrastructure that you see when you travel all around the country. It just, it just doesn't make sense. That's the benefit of a, well, I guess we'll get into it in a bit, but that's the benefit of a country that has significant, arguably uh, among the best in the world, um, you know, foreign exchange reserves relative to GDP and a insignificant amount of external debt, which allowed, which has allowed them to build out this great infrastructure including a bullet train that was self-financed um, and is Spanish technology. Mm-hmm. So the country has a lot going for it. Um, so th- that's a little bit of the history. Um, and this is a, a chart of the, the currency from early 2019. Um, of course, there's been depreciation. Um, you have in, I guess, between June and September in 2019, you have um, an adjustment higher. Um, and then you have another one earlier this year. The latter one was due to um, the fact that oil collapsed and Uzbekistan is not a big oil exporter, but two of its largest trading partners are Russia and Kazakhstan, which are very large oil exporters. So as their currencies weakened, the Uzbek soon weakened as well. Um, so it's similar to Vietnam where you have an exporting nation with a, a large and growing uh, manufacturing base. 
that's diversified. And this country wants to be able to remain competitive. So if you look at Vietnam around, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, I think the currency was around, the Vietnamese dong was around 12,000. Now it's around 23,000. Mm -hmm. So following a similar trajectory, but uh, my thesis is that you'll be able to um, outperform the depreciation of the currency through gains in the equity markets and or real estates or other investments due to the fact that this country is so cheap. Um, so on, on the foreign exchange bit, which you mentioned, Ladislaus, uh, about the, the GDP per capita, which is about $1,600 US, um, you know, they have $35 billion in foreign exchange reserves and about 22 billion of which is gold. That's insane. This is the, it is, it's the benefit of them being the ninth largest gold producer in the world. And they have the biggest open pit gold mine in the world. Um, so, and they have $22 billion roughly of external debts. So they could pay off their debt tomorrow if they wish. And I believe they have about 18 to 24 months right now of import cover. Wow. So yeah. a very strong balance sheet. So in a world of in a world of monetary insanity, there is Uzbekistan, which is essentially following Austrian economics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and the, the, what's great about the country is that there's been a, a trade deficit since the country opened up because they're reindustrializing um, pretty much the entire country. All the factories are being re revamping, upgrading the machinery. You're seeing investments in spinning mills and for, for textiles or for yarn, um, new textiles, textile factories coming up, uh, hotels, et cetera. So there's a massive uh, amount of imports, uh, but the country is able to support uh, or um, you know, support the, the current account deficit through gold sales, which is very unique, especially as the, I think you and I both agree that gold prices over the medium to long term will be rising significantly higher. So yeah. assuming that all other exports stopped, if you were Thailand, where depending on which stats you're looking at, if, if roughly you know, 20 odd percent of the country's GDP is tied to the tourism industry, that's stopped now. That's of course painful to Thailand. In Uzbekistan, if all exports of agricultural products, gas, et cetera, stopped, and they just exported gold, they'd arguably perfectly, or they'd arguably be perfectly fine. Yeah. So it's a very unique situation. And I must say that also most of their debt is soft loans. They issued a Euro bond um, about a year ago, mm -hmm. but it was only for a billion dollars. So oh. most of their debt is, uh, comes with very low interest rates and long duration. Yeah, it's interesting. And just from having spent a month there and, and talking to people, what was nice was the the level of confidence that people had in the reforms and the trajectory of the country and in a very grounded and sane way. So people were optimistic, but it's not the sort of optimism that you can see in, you know, 2017 with crypto where people were optimistic, but, you know, their eyeballs were in their heads and <laughs> nothing was making sense anymore or even in Budapest in real estate uh, as of last year. Um, it's just calm, confident optimism that is just backed by sound fiscal monetary policies and, and just good economics um, and fantastic demographics as well. I think you, you're going to touch on this as well. I will. And also there's, there's an aspect of the currency, which we can get into a little bit later. Um, I'm actually modestly bullish on the currency, um, at least some stability, stronger stability going forward. Um, okay. But uh, really, the theme for this country is you have, we could call it the potential to become a mini regional Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It has the manufacturing base. It has 34 million people. So it has the largest population in all of Central Asia. The average age is 29 years old. It's an under leveraged society because the cost of capital is terribly high here. So he or she who can pay cash for something pays cash for something. What are the interest uh, rates right now? So the due to COVID, the uh, the policy rate was lowered from 16 to 15%. But at the banks, if you're trying to get a mortgage or, or financing, you're looking at the 
probably the 25 to 30 percent range. And if you go to a microfinance institution, um, you're looking at 35 percent plus. Hmm. So the, the high cost of capital has inhibited significant growth in the country, which of course, when you were here, I'm sure you saw construction everywhere. Um, yeah. This country is really undergoing their first proper construction boom since the country was rebuilt uh, mm -hmm. by the Soviets in I believe the 60s when, when they had a massive earthquake that destroyed most of the city. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's early days. Um, but you have the demographic dividend of basically Uzbek baby boomers that are all getting married, having children, looking to buy cars, looking to buy consumer electronics, looking to buy homes. And as the cost of capital comes down, I think you're going to see an absolute boom here. Yeah. And you're, you were in the early stages of seeing it. I and mean, we came here early um, in, in 2018, but now you're seeing more foreign institutions looking to invest into the banks here. Mm -hmm. You have some of the state-owned banks issuing Euro bonds. So as more capital flows into the market, uh, along with new competition, so Georgian Bank TBC is here. They yeah. set up a, a local subsidiary, um, and they're a fully digital bank um, with the intention to have a few branches here, but it's, it's all online. You can apply for a loan online. Um, very easy. I have some friends that have done it. Um, and Freedom Fine, or excuse me, uh, Hulk Bank is here from Kazakhstan. Um, so is you have more competition and you have more money coming into the sector from abroad, theoretically that should lower the cost of capital over time, uh, along with inflation, which is running about 14, 15%. But this year you're seeing ironically lower inflation than last year, um, even though you had some shortages of you know, goods, say like uh, fl flour for baking due to the fact that they import from Kazakhstan. So when the borders were closed, prices spiked. Um, earlier this year, but they've come back down. So inflation's beginning to moderate and the government wants inflation to, they're targeting inflation of less than 10% by 2022. Um, okay. So you have this demographic dividend, which is basically, I think, waiting for cheaper capital to be able to really exercise their demand for goods and services. Um, but you also have a very diversified uh, economy. Uh, again, it's the natural hub for a manufacturer in the region to want to come to. Um, so the, the sixth largest producer of cotton in the world, the government over the next three to five years is putting together, well, it's already in process, that they're pretty clever creating a plan to make sure that raw cotton is no longer exported from the country. So starting this year, it is illegal to export raw cotton hmm. because China, Bangladesh, Turkey were previously buying cotton from the country. And of course, all the value add was realized in their countries. So you've had a lot of investment into spinning mills here, and now you can export yarn. Um, but over the next few years, there's going to be an export tariff. Of, I think it starts at 10 cents per per kilogram and it'll work its way up to 20 cents per kilogram with the hopefully intended consequences um, of this being that it incentivizes factories to move here. Yeah, you have I'm, the sure labor. I'm sure exactly. it will. I'm sure it will. There's the labor so, and people are, people are hardworking in Uzbekistan and uh, like everyone's literate, everyone can read, everyone, there's no problem with education. Um, and the minimum wage is, is how much again? It's in the 60s, but no one really pays the minimum wage. Certainly okay. much more than that. So one to $200, probably similar to Southeast Asia, um, okay. say Cambodia. Um, okay, or maybe but with Mexico. like much better infrastructure. Correct. And literacy um, rights and good literacy rights, which you don't have in Cambodia. True. And also, I, I guess one needs to look at this country and say it is one of the two double landlocked countries in the world. So it's Uzbekistan and Liechtenstein. Um, but, but Uzbekistan doesn't need to be supplying America with you know, socks and shoes, which Southeast Asia, it'll never be able to compete with because they mm -hmm. have the ocean. But Uzbekistan, with it being the central of, cent of Central Asia, at the center of Central Asia, and the intention for it to become a regional logistics hub means that this country should be able to be the de facto supplier of um, of goods to 
greater um, Central Asia, I guess the Commonwealth of Independent States, so Russia, all the way to Turkey, and, and of course China as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not very far from Almaty, where you have the railroad, which is connecting China to Europe. So mm -hmm. it's, it's well integrated. And I think that's the future of this country. And it's just getting started. Um, yeah. and that's, that's, that's also what I found interesting when I was in, in Uzbekistan. You can tell that investors were coming from pretty much everywhere. Um, you had, obviously, Russian investors because it's their zone of influence. Um, a number of American, European investors, a lot of Turkish investors because Uzbekistan is a, is a, a, a Uzbek is a Turkic language. Um, a number of Chinese investors because it's in their in their backyard. Um, Indian investors as well. A lot of Middle Eastern investors who are, who in, who invest in uh, Uzbekistan because it's it's a fellow Muslim country. So. It's just, it's the spot. I mean, it's Eurasia. If people believe that the center of the world is moving from the North Atlantic gradually towards Asia, you'll find that, you know, the center of the universe of the world is gradually not far from Uzbekistan. And FDI is just flowing in and people are going, coming from everywhere, investing in Uzbekistan. And they all have a historical reason in many ways to do so in a geo geopolitical reason as well so it's it's quite interesting from from that point of view capitals coming to uzbekistan not just for speculation but also because there's a reason and everyone wants to be there long term well and what's funny is that the infrastructure is certainly not bad but um you, you look at the hotel stock and outside of Tashkent where you have the Hyatt, the, the Hilton um, and some others coming, you know, you go to Samarkand, you go to Bukhara, Khiva, the ancient Silk Road, or you go to the Ferragana Valley, the hotels are not very nice and they're very expensive. Yeah. So there's a massive opportunity for foreigners to come in and build quality hotels. Obviously COVID is an issue, but that'll go away in due course. Um, but you're able to get land very cheap. And actually I have friends that are, building, um, you know, apartment buildings and whatnot here. And the cost of construction is more than the cost of the land, which is very rare. Wow. Uh, uh, that'll change in due course. Again, once yeah. you have, there's already a mortgage market, but once the mortgage market's more developed and the cost of capital comes down, the price of everything is going to boom. So yeah. it's really this play on this re-rating of a very diversified economy from manufacturing to commodities. Um, gold, of course, is a, a big export for the country. It's about a little less than 40% of exports, um, but consumption will be big. You have huge agricultural potential. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a fascinating story. It's just been overlooked by everyone because as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's a hardworking country, but w one of the things that I've noticed is that when I first came here, everyone said, is it real? Is it real? Is it real? Mm -hmm. And I, I started to ask myself, the same thing you know if if i see such amazing opportunity why am i the only one seeing it and after my first trip here i just kept reading the news paying attention talking with people here and i kept saying i think this is real yeah. and there are challenges of course but nonetheless it's moving in the right direction um yeah. it's becoming more and more capitalist more and more free market um bureaucracy is slowly going away so that's just a great opportunity and we'll get into it in a bit, but, but assets are just the cheapest I've ever seen. Um, yeah. It's similar to, you, you can say the former Soviet, you know, union countries, or I guess Russia, where you had you know, companies like Gazprom that were able to go up, you know, one, 200 X. Um, Uzbekistan is not that cheap, but it's similarly cheap. Hmm. Yeah. Cause so I'm um, talking about bureaucracy. I, when I was in Uzbekistan, I looked around, I was like, oh, let me try to go through the steps to create a local company to see how, how easy it is, how hard it is. Um, so granted, I, I speak Russian, so that helps. Um, but I went around to the government offices, asked a few questions, and everyone was extremely friendly, extremely helpful. <laughs> and creating a company takes uh, like 24 hours and was really not that much paperwork. So I was, I was quite impressed. I mean, it's, things are definitely improving fast. 
Now they just need to digitize the incorporation process, uh, which, which in due course they will. I mean, again, they're coming from doing st stacks and stacks of paperwork and loving paper. Um, it's funny because there are a lot of trees in this country, but there aren't that many trees. So they must be a net importer of a lot of trees. Um, but it's, it's an exciting place. And, and these are some of the, um, the brands that are currently doing business here. Um, Caro 4 isn't here yet, but they're coming. I think they're planning to open four stores over the next 12 months. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg based on what, what will be expected to come. I think there are about eight new international standard malls being built in Tashkent. Um, so it's, it's early days, but it's, you know, the, the inward tra trajectory of uh, foreign brands is beginning. And of course the Volkswagens and, and what, and Hyundai's are here as well. Cool. I mean, great. So I, when I went to Uzbekistan, my initial thought, my initial plan was to buy real estate, buy an apartment, hold it. And, but I came back with a brokerage account because the opportunities in the stock market were just too glaring. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So, you know, for Asia Frontier Capital, we only invest in listed equities. So that was the, the allure to us here is we knew there was a stock market, but weren't quite sure what there was. Um, so came here, took a look, and the Tashkent Stock Exchange was founded in 1994, similar to most post-Soviet countries. It was a voucher system and they distributed shares to the population and pretty much the entire economy is listed. So there are about 603 companies listed between the Tashkent Stock Exchange and the OTC market, including the state-owned auto company called Uzauto, which up here you'll see GM. They, they own the rights for GM here. Um, so they're listed. They, of course, don't trade, being that they're 100% state-owned, but the entire economy is listed. So on the Tashkent Stock Exchange right now, there are 121 companies. The market capitalization is 4.9 billion, which represents about 9.7% of GDP. And the first company to, to ever IPO is uh, Klartz, which is the largest producer of glass for windows and bottles in the country. And when they sold down following 5% through a secondary offering, this is where, of course, you and I met Lattice Loss. Yeah. Uh, and you know, for one of the questions I often get asked is, how are the accounts? Do the companies report earnings um, often, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think it's actually pretty good for the frontier markets that I've lived in. And every company reports quarterly earnings with an annual uh, filing. They have to file for EGMs, dividends, et cetera. Uh, the securities regulator is already required and they're already following it where the banks need to follow IFRS um, and be audited by one of the big four. So that's happening. And the next move is to have the blue chips do IFRS and um, be audited by the blue chips as well. So that's beginning. And in due course, it'll be a full, fully IFRS compliant um, exchange. And also what should happen in due course, the licensing is there for it, is that the OTC platform and the Tashkent Stock Exchange should be, will be merged together at some point. Mm -hmm. So you'll have 603 odd companies to be able to choose from, which again is pretty much the entire economy. Um, Interesting. And to give some context, this is the market capitalization in USD um, up until June of this year. So, cool. you know, the country, pretty much opened in the second half of 2016 and the market capitalization of the exchange is up about 500%. Cool. Now concerning the, concerning the AFC fund, concerning your fund, can you give us a breakdown of, of sectors or examples of some metrics of some of the companies you invest in? Sure. So all of these companies are in our portfolio. Um, just walking through the company descriptions. The, the first one is the largest steel company in the country. Uh, the cement is the largest cement company in the country. Talk about that in a little bit. Um, the next one is a bank, private bank. Um, the next is the, it's a, uh, it's the commodities exchange. So everything from lumber to plastics to 
um, even license plates. If you have a license plate and you want to sell it through the commodities exchange, you can. People in this part of the world associate status with a, a certain license plate number or even phone numbers, um, but of course it's mainly commodities, cement, et cetera. All of these commodities trade through the commodities exchange. And the next one is the largest consumer goods company in the country. Wow, so low PE ratios, high dividends. It's promising. And these companies are, most of them are very profitable, I assume? Very much so. Um, some of them have seen, you know, two, three, four hundred percent growth year over year in the past two years. Um, the, the cement company, I'll talk about it a little bit, for 2018, it paid a dividend equivalent to 20% for the yield. Um, and we might get something similar for 2019. So dividends are high. Um, the irony of the situation, and, and keep in mind that m most of these companies on this list have gone up at least 100%. Um, some of them have gone up north of 300% um, so since 2018. Isn't it, isn't it too late? Like, have, have people missed the party? Not at all. Um, you know, when we first came here, there were pretty much no active foreigners in the market. And now you're starting to see more and more, actually, ironically, post, um, I guess, post the first lockdown. So in May, the stock market really started to change. And my understanding is that there are more foreigners that are opening up brokerage accounts here because they see the opportunity, um, both for the broader country and also is the very cheap stocks on the stock market is a great way to get leverage to the country. Um, so I think it's, it's very much so early days. Um, I, I still find this funny when I speak with locals here, um, and I've seen the same in Kyrgyzstan, is you tell someone that a consumer goods company, which is growing at, I think, about 70% per year, um, it's up 200 odd percent in the past, call it 24 months. So it's, for, for Uzbekistan, that's, it really hasn't done anything. Um, they're just getting started. But again, their dividend yield is about 14%. The problem is that a, a local will say, but Scott, I can put my money into a term deposit in the bank in Uzbek Sum and get, um, you know, uh, until they lower the, the policy rate, you could get 20, 21%. Yeah. Um, now it's a bit lower, but they don't realize that there's the equity kicker, um, which you're getting as well. So I think that we're going to see a massive transformation in the stock markets, both as liquidity increases, which will be driven by the government privatizing its ownership stakes in many companies that are listed because there's heavy state ownership in the stock exchange. Um, but as the cost of capital comes down, investors are going to start to say, well, if the policy rates at 10% and I'm able to get you know, 13 or 14% in a term deposit, 14% is looking pretty good if I can also potentially make, you know, 20, 30% in, in the appreciation of the, of the stock price. Um, so I, I think that when that happens, combined with foreign investors coming in, and it, this will not happen tomorrow, but the, the potential is they work towards fulfilling the requirements that would permit them to be put on the watch list of the MSCI Frontier Index would get a whole lot of in foreign investors interested and realize that there's a stock market here. Um, all of that is coming in the future. Mm -hmm. So you have all that to look forward to. And I, I guess if, if, if I may, one other important yeah. thing is that um, talking with foreign investors, when we tell them the story of Uzbekistan, one of the first questions they ask is, so can I get the quotations for stock prices on Bloomberg? to which we answer, they're not there yet. So I've had to go through and build the database of these companies to figure out their PEs, their market caps, all of this. Um, there's general price and volume data on the Tashkent Stock Exchange website, but they're in the process of onboarding all of this data to Bloomberg. So foreign institutional investors or those who have access to a Bloomberg terminal, none of this is on there yet. And once mm -hmm. that gets on there, it's going to be on the radar of a totally different type of investor um, which has the potential to bring huge amounts of capital to the market here, um, which I is exciting. I think those are very valid points because one of the 
So you can go in like some Asian markets, you can look at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, you can look in Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, you can find these huge East Asian companies that have reasonable growth, um, rock solid balance sheets, good yields, and nothing happens. They're value traps. You, you know, you buy them, you buy deep value, and you wait for years until hopefully a catalyst, you know, happens, and then you see a re-rating of the stock. But what I find interesting about Uzbekistan is that in many cases, such companies have yields that are dividend yields that are bigger. Um, they have balance sheets that are also completely rock solid. They're in a market that's booming, unless, unlike you know Japan and Korea and, and Hong Kong. So you just see that natural growth growth rate. And then um, barely any foreign exposure. Uh, interest rates are going down, like you said. So there are many, many catalysts for a re-rating of, of these stocks. So the, the value trap, which is often a, a, a risk when you invest in some markets uh, with good numbers, I don't think is the case in Uzbekistan. There are just too many catalysts not far away. Well, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, there are so many catalysts right on the horizon that are beginning to happen now. And of course, one of the big ones is, you know, you and I both come from Western countries, which are the most indebted they've ever been. Um, Uzbekistan, again, it has, I believe, what, $35 billion in, in foreign exchange reserves for a $52 billion economy, $22 billion in external debt. Um, on, on our screen right here, I, I believe only one company has some debt. All of the other, co all of the other companies are debt-free. There's no leverage in the system, which means that as the cost of capital comes down and it makes sense for them to leverage their balance sheet, you're going to see a whole new type of growth that this country has never seen before, um, which might arguably be more powerful than some of the other trends that we talked about. Um, but you know, new money coming into the market is, of course, key. Um, but, but there's no leverage in the entire economy because just the cost of capital is too high. So you're really playing this demographic dividend, the cost of capital coming down, and you'll get local investment into the stock market with foreign investments as well. Um, and you potentially have the makings of a spectacular boom. So for my, for my subscribers, would you be kind enough to mention one of the blue chip companies and potentially show some of the exact metrics? Sure. So the second company that we have here is the cement company. I'll be talking about them. Oh, sorry, forgot to update this. Um, so Kizilkum Cement um, was founded in uh, 1977. It's the largest cement company in Uzbekistan. Uh, their capacity is 3.45 million tons, and they're in the process of expanding capacity with the production, uh, with with a new 1.1 million ton uh, clinker line. So clinker is the material that is produced in sort of the phase one process of cement production. You take the clinker, grind it with some limestone and some laterite, which is iron ore, and you have cement. So um, that is what they're working on right now. Um, but for their existing production capacity, they're operating at 104%. Um, the company has no debt. Um, it's up, I believe, about 56% um, year to date, or about 50% year to date. Um, again, it trades at a PE of 2.89, 2 price to book 0.63, or sorry, excuse me, year over year EPS, or year over year EPS growth is 30%. Sorry, I have to stop you here. When you say it grew 50% this year, I'm making my happy dance because uh, <laughs> I put the equivalent of a car in, the, in this company. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so, and it, it's still cheap. So, um, you know, I, I restructured a cement plant um, in, in Myanmar and, and learned way too much about the cement industry. And normally new production or replacement costs for one ton of installed capacity is between 100 and 120 dollars US. And with their new 1.1 million tons of capacity that they're building, it's going to come out to about 110, 120 dollars. Uh, with this with this Russian technology, 
but right now if you value the company based on the amount of cash that they have on their balance sheet um, which is significant to present um, but their their enterprise value per ton of installed capacity is ten dollars and thirty three cents per ton relative to the cost of new capacity at between a hundred and a hundred twenty dollars that is insane so, that's insane <laughs> Exactly. So even though the stock's up about 50% year to date, um, you know, let's slap a, a nice big Uzbek discount on here and could it go up 500% from here? I don't see why not. Um, yeah. It's remarkably cheap. And you know, this company for 2019 has not yet announced dividend. Their, their AGM is next week. Um, but for 2018, their dividend payout at the time equated to a yield of around 20%. And with, and this is a majority state-owned company. This is about 85% state ownership. So with some of the other listed companies which have state ownership, um, this year they paid out 85% of profits. So if Kizilkum Cement was to pay out 85% of profits, um, that would equate to a 21% dividend yield. Wow. Yeah. Which is a little better than what you can get in a bank term deposit. So um, <laughs> not bad. Yeah. So um, if thanks to you, I turn that one car into five cars, uh, beers on me. Just don't buy a lot of, I saw one today <laughs> that was going up a little driveway and it started smoking. <laughs> cool. So there, there's one question that I have to, to go back because we, we discussed um, the currency and that was actually my biggest concern when I when I first uh, looked at Uzbekistan. This chart that you're showing is part of the story because if you go back to September 2015, the Uzbek sum was at 2,600 per USD, and as of today, it is at 10,300 per USD in just five years. So a massive devaluation, which had you invested back in 2015 in the stock market, you probably wouldn't be up right now. I don't know. I haven't done the numbers, but it's hard to it's hard to make money if the if the currency continues to devalue this much. Can you elaborate? What are your thoughts on this? Sure. So the story of Uzbekistan is really interesting because the Intercontinental Hotel, Le Meridian Hotel, used to be here. A bunch of other foreign enterprises. Uzbekistan was open and booming, so say between 2005 and 2009. Um, but there were still capital controls. So what happened is you had a two-tier system, even in the stock market, where shares for foreigners were transacted normally in USD, while locals would trade in, in local currency. Because once you had local currency, you couldn't convert it to USD or Euro. You couldn't get it out of the country. But if you had uh, foreign currency in the country, you could take it out, no problem. So what happened is you actually had a big stock market boom and whatnot. Um, and you had foreigners investing here, but come 2009 foreign, you know, multinational said, we're going to leave Uzbekistan. We want to repair our balance sheet. Uzbekistan is a rounding error. So we'll leave the country and nothing really happened here until um, they adjusted the currency a few years back. And to, to your point is, you know, the stock market was very, very quiet because why would you invest at, you know, why would you bring money to the country at say 4,000 when the black market um, rate was say 8,000 and you immediately lose a huge portion of your money? Mm -hmm. um, doesn't make much sense. So mm -hmm. everything was pretty much dormant. Um, what's happened is in 16, 17, um, what they did is they said the black market rate is 8,100. So if we want to attract foreign investment, no one is going to come here and lose half of their money overnight. Um, so we need to adjust the fixed rate of the Uzbek Zoom versus the Euro and the USD. And this is of course the USD um, chart, but we, we need to adjust the, the rate to the black market rate. So they adjusted it to 8,100, which was a little bit over the black market. Then you'll see in um, August of 2019 on this chart, that's when they said the currency is going to float freely. So you had another big jump. And then 
in you know April May of this year when you had the the oil crisis when oil went negative well the ruble in Russia blew out the Kazakh tangi blew out and those two countries are very big oil exporters Uzbekistan has both of them as very large top five trading partners so the Uzbek soon devalued as well and the central bank adjusted um, the the way that they the central bank used to publish um, the, the currency rates every three days, and then they moved it to every day. And due to the fact that everyone here in Uzbekistan knows the sum to historically depreciate and that it follows the tangi and it follows the ruble, um, as it did in 14 to 15 when you know, had Russian sanctions and you had the other oil crisis. Um, so everyone here switched to USD and sold all of their sum and you had a big spike. And that's what mm -hmm. this spike was. Mm -hmm. um, so, but now the currency is freely floating based on the supply and demand of the market. And I, I, I think that just like with, with locals saying that they are worried about buying stocks here because the dividend isn't high enough relative to the you know, percentage rate of a term deposit, forgetting the underlying equity that they'd own. The, the, there's the similar stigma around the currency here. And, you know, we've been investing here since 2018 and we've had positive performance in USD terms. Of course, if the currency was more stable, we'd be up even more. So we're outperforming the depreciation. But again, this is the same thing that happens in many developing countries, yep. Vietnam, et cetera. Um, but but I, I think that Uzbeks have been burned by holding Uzbek sum for long periods of time that they don't think the currency can ever appreciate. And I, I think that we're towards the beginning of perhaps prolonged stabilization, maybe not mm -hmm. tomorrow, but a period of prolonged stabilization and potential appreciation because there were about $10 billion of foreign direct investment last year. Um, the problem is that the majority of foreign direct investment into this country is coming in uh, to the infrastructure, power, mining sectors, uh, oil and gas, and these sectors all do business in USD. So there's no need to convert the currency to buy Uzbek soon. Now, as you see more foreign investors come here to set up textile factories and hotels, uh, coffee shops, et cetera, all of them are going to have to convert their foreign currency into Uzbek Sum, which will of course increase demand for it. And I, I think that that type of FDI, which we're on the cusp of, I think we'd already be getting, be beginning to see that happen if it wasn't for COVID, yeah. um, has the potential to create prolonged stability and potentially see appreciation because you'll also see, you know, since you can't arbitrage the, the interest rate differential between a Western country and here, um, is the cost of, or is the policy rate comes down and the cost of capital comes down and inflation comes down, um, ideally all below 10%, you, you should see a much healthier currency regime. Cool. And I think that that will actually potentially attract more money here where people say, I see the opportunity, but I'm worried about this historical perpetual depreciation and they might very well start to run towards it, which creates a positive feedback loop, which creates a degree of Dutch disease, which I think creates a whole other set of issues. But if you own assets in the country or securities, um, it's wonderful because you'll have the potential makings of a boom in the market here while you have a strengthening currency, um, which is you know, you're, you're the wind at your back. Fantastic. Thanks for thanks for addressing this, Scott. I mean, and this is what I I try to do with the wandering investor. It's to expose people to a world of opportunities. And I firmly believe that Uzbekistan will do great in the coming years. I'm very bullish on Uzbekistan. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but I actually see investing in Uzbek stocks as low risk. It's a low risk proposition with potential higher 
high rewards. You don't get that a lot in life. And Uzbek, is, Uzbek equities at this point in time are exactly this. It's a much healthier environment to, to invest your money. And the country has so much going for it. Where can, um, where can people find out more about the fund? Uh, they can go to asiafrontiercapital.com or feel free to email me at so Scott Osheroff. So so at asiafrontiercapital.com. Fantastic. So these details will be below here in the in the YouTube description. Also, feel free to join the mailing list at AFC. You have a number of funds specializing in other frontier markets, and do join the private list at the Wandering Investor. It's free. Um, YouTube videos are only a small part of what I do, and you'll have access to a number of uh, research, uh, investment research from various countries around the world. Scott, thank you. Always a pleasure. Likewise. And um, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.